I've used, you know, T3, Clen, DNP, I've tried everything. The thing that I found the most effective in the pharmacology realm What's up guys, Derek, moreplacemartaids.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about my top fat loss tips as well as talking about some of the stuff I've done in the past for fat loss and you know my overarching opinions on it, um, as well as you know kind of some overviews of pharmacology. But mainly, the tail end of this video or the bulk of it is going to be some tips that I'm nearly positive at least some of these you're not going to have heard on other channels and are going to be unique things that you might wanna delve into further yourself that's gonna help with, um, mostly with adherence to your diet, which is the number one killer of people not getting lean pretty much. So the first thing I'm gonna to touch on before I get into it, um, like when I first started bodybuilding, I did the same thing, you know, the same mistakes that many of you guys have probably done before, just, you know, did the dirty bulk thing. And, um, you know, I just like, thought more food equals more muscle so i just got fat as fuck and i went up as high as i think at my highest i was like 255 260 or something and it was like one of my first bulk so i was just fat as hell and then in my subsequent cut i had to lose like almost i think it was like 70 to 80 pounds or something to get to single digit body fat percentage again so it was just like disgusting unhealthy not recommended but anyways the things that i incorporated to get um, shredded in the past, like even much leaner than I am now, stuff that I used to do when I used to prepare for, you know, um, bodybuilding shows and stuff, and just for, uh, you know, my own personal recreational, um, torturing myself to get as lean as fucking possible, um, some of the stuff I did. So the first thing I kind of want to just like glance over quick is some of the pharmacology, because I know I'm going to get questions about this is, I've used, you know, T3, Clen, DNP, I've tried everything. The thing that I found the most effective in the pharmacology realm of like fat burning, you know, fat burners necessarily, not necessarily something that burns fat directly, but something that's going to enhance my fat loss in some capacity is something that crushes my appetite. So stimulants is something I used to leverage quite heavily. I've never used anything as hardcore as like Phentermine or Adderall or anything like that, even though those are super effective purportedly, but I used to use stuff like the ECA stack, um, ephedrine, caffeine, aspirin stack. I used to use um, heavy duty stims, over the counter stuff. Nowadays, for when I wanna suppress my appetite, I just use Gorilla Mind Rush and I find that actually works better than the ECA stack. At the tail end of some of my cuts, when I would get into the single digits, I would need to incorporate Melanotan too as well. Now why, you might be thinking, why would you need to use a injectable peptide that makes you tanned to get cut? And it's not, you know, for some crazy fat burning effect, even though it may, you know, enhance insulin sensitivity. And there's some interesting data on that. It's that it fucking destroys your appetite. It actually makes you kind of nauseous. But when you're super, super hungry, the nauseousness almost balances out the extreme hunger and it just leaves you in the middle and you're just like not hungry. So... That was something I used to use too. I don't necessarily recommend it. I also tried Meridia too, which is like a prescription medication that's been discontinued for appetite suppression. And I didn't find much from that. Anyways, as far as anything else, DNP, I didn't like it. Um, cranked my appetite through the roof and I found it counterproductive to be honest. And it just like, you know, wrecked my workouts and just, you know, made me feel and look like shit. Clan worked really well for me. T3. Um, I used to abuse T3 like an idiot and it, you know, I definitely stripped some muscle off my frame. Even on anabolics, if you overdo T3, you're gonna lose muscle. Um, it's very, very catabolic. But something that I do think should be, uh, you know, highlighted is that a lot of people during prep, I don't necessarily think that T3 is, you know, a mandatory thing, but if you're like getting into a deep, deep cut and you're severely depriving yourself of not just, you know, micronutrients as you get into a deeper deficit, but you're also, you know, depriving so many macronutrients that your body can't even function, you know, correctly and can't even facilitate proper um, thyroid hormone production and whatnot. And you're stressing out um, and cranking your TSH up and stressing out your thyroid to get, you know, even mediocre function. It may be prudent to perhaps incorporate T3 to take stress off of it. Like a similar you know, mechanism to how you would think about 
using insulin to like relieve the beta cells in the pancreas and blah, blah, blah. It's not, you know, insulin resistance and all that kind of stuff. Um, a sort of similar thing, in my opinion, should be, you know, explored further when it comes to thyroid usage in even just like a replacement amount to, or like a high normal, you know, like physiologic high normal amount during a cutting phase for those who are going like into a really aggressive or a very long drawn out cut. That's something you might want to work with with your doctor. But anyways, um, anything else, um, injectable L-carnitine, Yohimbine, and GH seem to work well in a fasted state prior to cardio, prior to cardio being very important actually, prior to fasted cardio being very important with these three in particular. Uh, but other than that, that's just some of the pharmacology stuff that you know I know people are gonna ask about and wanna know about as far as fat loss goes and those are things that I felt were worth touching on. But anyways, some of the diet practices now and sort of like hacks for sticking to your diet. This is the biggest weakness everyone has. So. How can you get lean as hell without cheating on your diet? So first off, I want to make clear, this is not necessarily healthy recommendations. This is not about, once you start getting steep into you know 500 plus calorie deficit, it's no longer about hitting your micronutrient needs adequately. Like if you could, that's great. But some of those foods simply just aren't satiating, unfortunately. And on top of that, you're going to have to start incorporating things that otherwise are not necessarily, you know, the healthiest thing to use, you know, a lot of zero, kind of like zero calorie, artificial sugar type stuff, or, you know, things that may not even be food at all. But anyways, that's what we're going to be getting into. So just be clear, because I have a lot of, you know, health and longevity related content too. And this is not indicative of a Daily diet practice I would recommend this is strictly for aggressive cutting. So the first thing, getting rid of all your post-workout shakes. Um, I don't know why people still do this in their cutting phases, they still have liquid calories and it's like the least satiating thing you can have, replace all your liquid calories with actual food. And ideally something that takes you, or I'll get into the uh, density of the foods and whatnot later. But anyways, the first thing you should do is get rid of all the liquid calories in your diet and replace it with actual chewable food ideally the next thing carbonated drinks so um you know like sparkling water or something that you know can help sort of like artificially promote um satiety feeling in your stomach um something else too uh zevia if you've ever had it's like kind of like calorie free diet pot basically but it's stevia flavored instead of aspartame and sucralose um and honestly even if you have diet pop if it has aspartame or sucralose um, if that's what you need to stick to your diet, um, you kind of just got to weigh out the, you know, health, to whatever, like reward on that. Because at the end of the day, it's not like there's conclusive evidence that proves that having one can of whatever a day for a span of 16 weeks is going to like ruin your life. So it's kind of up to you. But anyways, that is a very effective thing is incorporating diet pop as well. Uh, black coffee is also a very tried and true method for suppressing your appetite. And most people screw this up by adding in, you know, like sugar, MCT oil, or like keto bomb things or whatever, and adding a bunch of extra calories to it, thinking that it's still, you know, like diet friendly, when in reality, you should just be adding like stevia to it for, you know, sweetening. And then after that, like that's, you know, there's stuff you could add on top of that that are zero calorie too. But I mean, one of the biggest mistakes I see is guys who think they're using, you know, uh, you know, like nearly zero calorie coffee and they're, you know, writing it down in their, you know, macro calculations at zero when in reality, they're adding a bunch of unnecessary extra shit into it. And Stevia, if you haven't tried it, it's, you know, it tastes like real sugar, pretty much zero calories. Uh, it's not going to crank your insulin through the roof. It is a, you know, pretty good alternative. Next thing is sugar-free jello. So this is probably one of the most overlooked diet hacks in my opinion. It is it tastes, you know, super sugary, tastes like, you know, a good dessert. You can also get the the actual like fruit flavors are way lower calorie. Um, it's like 10 calories per serving. You can make an entire box of this stuff that makes a giant bowl for like 50 calories or something. I'd have to double check what it is exactly, but it's very, very low. And then you could get, you know, like there's like the chocolate pudding versions, which are more calories, obviously, but they're still, you know, pretty light considering how much you can actually eat of this stuff. And it tastes really damn good. When I get really deep into a cut, sometimes I'd have like a full bowl of this stuff every single day, just cause it's, it's very satiating and it gives you that, uh, you know, that sugar hit that you sort of feel like you need even without actually getting it because it is just artificial sweeteners in this thing at the end of the day. And um, 
you know, like two, oh, here it is. Two full packages are only 80 calories. So that's a ton. And like, you'd be shocked if you saw this stuff, you'd be like, this is 80 calories, that's nuts. And it is a very good um, diet hack for adherence, at least. Uh, it makes sticking to a diet way easier. Next thing is, um, you know, like zero calorie sauces, dressing, syrups, condiments, spreads, and dips. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can go into with this. There's, you know, like pancake syrups that you can make, you know, like protein pancakes and put pancake syrup on it. There's a uh, salad dressing. Some of the salad dressings are way too calorie dense and people don't count them into their macros and it ends up, they end up like gaining fat and they don't realize that their Caesar dressing is like super fucking fat dense and they just think, oh, I'm having a giant salad and that's what my coach told me to do. And it's like, bruh, like don't put the, the Caesar dressing on it with the croutons. Like you gotta use either a low calorie dressing or just eat it with, you know, something that is uh, more conducive to hitting your macros. One of the biggest mistakes with the salads is people that just like, they think because they're eating a salad, they're sticking to the diet. But in reality, it's like a fucking 700 calorie thing. They might as well have ate a cheeseburger instead. I already mentioned the diet soda. Another thing, sugar-free gum. So this is a good way to, it's like five calories per piece, um, keeps your mouth busy and also promotes satiety in the body and can help prevent you from getting as hungry. I don't know if a lot of people know that or not, but it's, I don't hear it talked about very often is the chewing effect, kind of like the signals that sends your brain in terms of satiety. And it also gives you a bit of that, you know, appeasing your sugar craving. Next thing is, so I already talked about the salads too. The main thing is have like a giant salad, but don't, you know, put in the garbage in it. Like just be aware of if you're going to put in that shit, just, you have to be very meticulous about calculating it because a lot of people don't weigh out dressing. They kind of just like pour it on and eyeball it, but I can almost guarantee you you're off. So if you're gonna use a dressing, use a low calorie one or actually weigh the bottle on the scale, pour it on the thing and then weigh the bottle and find the difference and make sure you're actually sticking to your macro allotments or put the salad on the scale and then add the dressing. <laughs> That's another way to, a probably smarter way to measure it now that I'm thinking about it. Um, and make sure you're staying within your macro allotments because a lot of people, they just use way too much um, or they shouldn't even be using that at all because it's you could be filling those calories up with something far more satiating than that. Another thing, uh, PB2 peanut butter. So this is something that I used to add into my oats to make them uh, not taste like ass. And um, they're pretty damn good, honestly. So this is basically like, 85% less fat than normal peanut butter. PB2 peanut butter is an all natural powdered peanut butter product deriving from peanuts and are slow roasted and then pressed to remove the fat and oil. Basically this stuff is like the diet friendly version of peanut butter and some people, like to be honest, I'm not like a huge peanut butter like fiend, like some, I don't know what, what what's with chicks and peanut butter. It's like the number one thing they want when they're dieting for some reason. Uh, but anyways, it's good, don't get me wrong. When you use it in this, in this form, you can use two tablespoons of it. It's only 45 calories and it's five grams of protein. And there's like no fat. So it's kind of like, you can add it into protein shakes to make them taste really good. You can add it into your oatmeal. You could put it into protein pancakes. You can put it into French toast, I guess, if you wanted to. You could put it into pretty much anything that is, uh, I don't know, makes sense to put it into. I don't know, but it's fucking good to be honest. And it's not something I would eat year round, but for an aggressive dieting phase, you know, it's very good to add flavor to your meals that you would otherwise would be impossible to get because normally you'd have peanut butter, you'd have one tablespoon with like, you know, two to three times the calories of this. So the next thing, this is one of the most overlooked hacks in my opinion that no one seems to talk about, shirataki noodles. So these look and taste, well, I don't know if they taste exactly the same as pasta noodles, but they're close enough if you're an aggressive deficit. So they aren't carb dense whatsoever and they have no calories whatsoever pretty much. So the fact, the brand I use has zero calories in an entire package. This stuff is a fantastic dieting tool in my opinion because you can cook two whole packages of this stuff and have a giant, you know, like chicken and noodle bowl and it, it can, you know, it's only like 250 calories. It's just, it's just the chicken that you count towards it and whatever sauce you put on it. So you can have like a giant bowl, like fucking as big as you want. And you just have to count the chicken breast and the sauce basically. Like the noodles are almost nothing, but they still fill you up. And they are like, to be honest, if you're, if you're at like maintenance or in a surplus and you eat these noodles, you'd be like, this is fucking like, I don't, there's no way I'd eat this. But when you're in a deficit, stuff that normally you think is not that appetizing is like 
insanely good. So if you can get this stuff, fill up a big bowl of it, cut up some chicken breast in it, put in some sort of, uh, you know, like low calorie sauce, whether, whether it's like Frank's Red Hot, you wanna mix in some mustard, whether you wanna put in um, an artificially sweetened, you know, like barbecue sauce or a, you know, some sort of like low calorie pasta sauce or something. Like it's fucking good. And you're gonna thank me when you try this. One thing I used to use is this stuff called a Seal Sama sugar-free teriyaki sauce. And I'd put it in these uh, shirataki noodles with chicken breast and it was unreal. I'd make like a um, teriyaki chicken bowl. Um, also the uh, sugar-free guys barbecue sauce. Um, it's only five calories, one gram sugar, one gram carb, zero gram sugar per tablespoon. And the main issue I found with like low calorie barbecue sauces, they were always too thin and they run like water, but this stuff is thick. It's like almost identical to a normal barbecue sauce and it tastes very, very good. It tastes nearly identical to a super calorie dense one with tons of sugar in it. And this stuff can be a game changer for putting on uh, your meat. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, it's really good, trust me. And um, the shirataki teriyaki sauce, or the, the seal sama teriyaki sauce is unreal too. Another thing, huge protein ice cream blender containers. So like you have a, uh, you know, like uh, whatever blender you have, doesn't matter. If you can make protein ice cream, um, you can make a very low calorie um, satiating dessert basically and you know that's a good opportunity to put in the uh, pb2 peanut butter in it too you could put in you know some chocolate protein you could even put in some of that powder uh jello stuff if you end up getting like a chocolate flavor or something um you put in the pb2 you mix it up boom you have like the most ridiculous giants you know just put as much ice in it as you need and you make the most nutty you know good tasting whey protein um you know, giant ice cream dish. And it's like, you know, a couple hundred calories max. Um, just don't burn your blender out like I did. Cause I've actually done that before where my Vitamix, I literally overheated because I was trying to make too thick of ice cream. So Vitamix is probably not a good bet if you're going to be in the market for a new blender. Cause they overheat super easily with protein ice cream, which you would think not. Cause it's such a highly touted machine that cost a lot of money and I was kind of annoyed when it burned out on me. Also low fat popcorn. So the 94% uh, fat free one or whatever, that one's pretty good too. Um, also another tip as far as not necessarily the food, carbohydrate timing. So one thing that used to completely ruin my chances of sticking to my diet was if I had, first of all, if I ate too early in general, that was like, something that could really screw me over because once I spike my insulin up, it's like opening the flood the floodgates and then I just wanna keep eating. If I can just not eat for like the first eight hours I'm awake, that gives me an eight hour window to fill up with all my calories and then I sleep for eight hours. So it's kind of like a 16, eight intermittent fasting split, which I feel like is very good. Once you start to get into a steeper deficit, it's very hard to spread your meals out equally. I find it's just easier to adhere to my, you know, like a severely calorie deprived diet model in a more condensed eating window, I guess. And then, because once I start eating, like I said, my insulin spikes up and then I'm just, I'm just going, I can't stop. But before that point, I can really hold it off with some of the stuff I mentioned earlier, like the, the sugar-free, the gum, the, you know, the diet pop, the uh, stimulants, the blah, blah, blah. So uh, the melanotan, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, the uh, not having carbs in your first meal too, if you're going to do the intermittent fasting thing, or even if you're not, the first meal having carbohydrates, like I said, when you spike your insulin up, that is when, like I'm sure you've probably noticed if you've done keto diets versus carb dense diets, um, in a deficit, when you have the carbs, it's typically when it's going to spike your appetite more. And it's when you keep your blood sugar stable that it's a lot easier to adhere to your diet and not go, you know, ravage your pantry and like fall off your diet completely. So typically I would allocate your carbohydrate consumption around your workout window or just later as late in the day as you can. Um, simply because once you eat that first carbohydrate dense meal, the floodgates are open, at least for me they are. So I kind of try to hold it off for as long as possible. And to me, this was super, super helpful 
in um, sticking to my diet. If you have really bad cravings too, a keto diet might be worth trying just because like if you can't stick to your calorie allotment with carbs in your diet, like keeping your blood sugar very, very stable with keto is something that some people just need to adhere to their diet. Like whether it's optimal or not for performance and whatever, it doesn't really matter if you're not sticking to the diet. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, you have to hit your calorie allotment. So next thing, high protein diet. So, you know, some people, they want to argue about how much protein you need. Oh, one gram per pound is too much or it's too little. 1.5 is overkill, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, protein, I find the most satiating of all of the macronutrients. Reason being fat, everyone says it's so satiating, but it's so calorie dense. Like I would, I remember I used to have, you know, a meal that was like perfectly ratioed between like protein, a bit of carbs, and then fats. And I'd have like, I'd have like 10 almonds and it would be like the equivalent of a few ounces of meat that I could have had otherwise that I finished in two seconds. It just wasn't satiating at all. So to me, fat is like if you're in a keto diet, obviously it can be, you know, leverage way more because you're stable blood sugar wise. But when you're in a carb diet and you're de deprived of calories, to me, fats is very difficult to get satiety from, at least in my experience. So I would typically push the protein higher, not necessarily because I think it is critical for muscle preservation, more so because I think it is more useful for sticking to the diet. In carbohydrates, I try to limit uh, more so for the reason of the insulin. Like I said, when you spike it up, it starts to create these cravings that you may otherwise be able to avoid if you just ratioed out your macronutrient propor proportions a bit differently. Um, on top of that, satiating proteins, swapping out red meat for white meat slowly, but still hitting your macros. So let's just say your diet, your bulk, you have you know a few meals of you know six ounces of extra lean ground beef or something. Like one of the easiest things you can do to start to cut down on your calorie intake is just switch out the red for white meat. Like just from that, you're gonna be eating the same amount of food visually and you know texturally, I don't know, like the way your stomach recognizes it in terms of the amount, but it's way less calorie dense. So you're eating the same amount, you know, perspective wise, um, but in reality, there's just way less fat in it and way less calories. So it is more satiating in that you're not basically having to deprive yourself of quantity as much. It's kind of hard to explain, but basically it's like you're eating the same amount, but it's way less calories. So you're eating less calorie dense options. It's just a very easy way to kind of reduce your calorie intake without actually having to start pulling out like quantities of food. So that is one thing, as well as if you're not gonna switch out for white, at least switch for higher quality cuts of red and get uh, leaner cuts, like switching for ground bison versus regular ground beef. The difference in just the quality of meat too, but also the calorie amount per ounce, it's pretty significant. Also another thing I don't really do, but is actually useful for some people is um, getting meat that is harder to chew. So if you have a steak versus ground beef, obviously, you're gonna chew the steak longer, which not only causes your body to release more hydrochloric acid and actually digest it more properly um, and absorb the nutrients to promote satiety, but it gives your body a chance to trick itself into being satiated quicker. So by that, basically, I'm sure you've probably heard of before where um, it takes your body a certain amount of time before it can send signals to the brain saying it's full. Um, if you eat something that's very, very easy to chew, you're giving, you're basically like going over that feedback system quicker than you may otherwise want to. Because if you can get that system to kick in faster before you ate as much, you're going to get to a point where you feel full with less food. Do you know what I mean? So typically, if you can find something that's chewier, you're going to get those signals sent to your brain before you accidentally overeat. You don't want to overeat past the point where you could have otherwise felt satiated already if you just had a, you know, better choice of meat, essentially. Also, ensure proper gut health and stomach acidity. So this is something that goes overlooked by most people, um, and especially those with autoimmune issues and gut health issues. This is a very critical component that not only is going to massively impact if you even absorb micronutrients to begin with, 
but also that your body is satiated because you're actually absorbing what you're trying to digest. So rather than have something just like sitting in your stomach or causing a backlog of bacteria or causing autoimmune issues from undigested proteins that are sitting there and causing fermenting and whatnot, um, you wanna get enough hydrochloric acid in there and you want to ensure you have high enough stomach acidity to actually break down what you're eating and make sure it gets processed correctly and assimilated in the body into all the target tissues and you get your micronutrients in, not just get them into your stomach, but they actually get absorbed because this is going to make a big difference on not only performance and fat loss, but just you know how you feel as well after the meal. And if you feel good or you feel bad, you feel satiated or you don't feel satiated. Um, another thing, so swapping out very obvious like high calorie dense things for low calorie dense things. So um, things like milk, you know, switching that out for an almond milk or something like that. Um, those are just really, you know, easy um, things to knock off the list kind of thing. Like as you go through the first most obvious way to cut down on calories is just look at what you're eating and then try and find something that is the same quantity, you know, like visually, like perspective wise, it's the same amount of food but it is less calorie dense. So, you know, that could be, like I mentioned, the red meat thing, finding higher quality, leaner cuts or switching to white when needed, stuff like that. Another thing, having more volume in your meals and more fiber dense meals is going to promote satiety as well. Um, that's pretty obvious. Most people know that, um, but it's worth mentioning nonetheless. Titrating your calories slowly and incrementally increasing your energy expenditure. Something I see as one of the biggest mistakes of cutting is guys who cut their calories way too aggressively off the bat and then they essentially encourage metabolic adaptations far quicker than they would have otherwise had occurred should they have cut slower. Now I'm not saying if you have some sort of like deadline you shouldn't cut aggressively, um, but what I am saying is that typically I always had better results when I reduced my calories slowly and increased my ex calorie energy expenditure slowly too rather than just crash dieting. And this would keep my more muscle on my frame, prevent me from having to go as deep into a deficit to achieve the same body composition I was trying to chase, um, all that kind of stuff. Like the people who cut to, you know, like 2000 calories off the bat, they'll lose fat crazy quick for the first few weeks. But once they plateau, where do you go from there? You're gonna go to girl levels of, you know, calories? Like, you know, a 220 pound guy eating like 1800? Like, no, you're not. At that point, you just fucked yourself. So don't do that because that's one of the biggest mistakes I see. Um, another thing, this is the last thing, 10 minute walks. So this is something I got from Stan Efforting. It helps for digestion and insulin sensitivity. More steps are correlated with increased longevity and best body composition are always from those who have good energy expenditure. I'm sure you already know this, but you don't have to revolve your life around cardio, which is, you know, first of all, adhering to cardio is something that can be difficult. So if you can do just like something a little here and there, maybe it's a bit easier for you. For me, I find the 10 minute walks more enjoyable and funner and just a lot easier um, than uh, the, you know, like 45 minute blocks of cardio instead. And so they actually did a study on this. Blood sugar levels were measured with fasting blood samples, blood glucose meters, and continuous glucose monitors. The researchers found that when participants walked for 10 minutes after each meal, their blood sugar levels were an average of 12% lower than when they took a single 30 minute walk each day. So instead of doing an allocated 30 minute block once a day, doing a 10 minute walk after each meal kept blood sugar levels much lower and it has a net positive effect on your body composition as well as I feel it just helps um, digestion quite a bit after you have a giant meal the last thing you want to do is just, you know, sit there and let it, you know, ferment and fucking <laughs> like ideally you want to do some sort of process that facilitates nutrient partitioning. And I feel like the 10 minute walks really help accomplish that. And it helps blood glucose control, which at the end of the day, not only is something that is optimal for longevity, but it is also um, something that helps encourage fat loss and um, just proper digestion processes in general. So anyways, those are all my tips. So hope you guys enjoyed that and found some of them useful and insightful and um, applicable to whatever you're doing. So thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram at moreplates underscore more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, BitChute, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you're listening to the podcast 
audios, please drop a five, five star rating. It really helps the algorithm on uh, Apple Podcast, I'm assuming. Um, if you can drop a like and comment here on YouTube too, it really helps the algorithm here for sure. I know that. So if you can do that, that's really appreciated. Anything that you want to support the channel, if you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below. Also, if you want to get updated whenever I post new articles on bodybuilding pharmacology and anything, you know, longevity, um, drug, hair loss related, lifestyle, whatever it is, check out the first link in the video description below and sign up for that. It's free. And the only way you're going to get sent those articles when I publish them are if you're on that list and they have um, some of my more deep dives into pharmacology and whatnot with concise subsections with table of contents and hyperlinks to all the clinical studies I reference so you can delve into further yourself for your own personal research and whatnot. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.